Okay, hello everyone. Uh, we are happy to get back uh, to our e-seminar series this week with a great presentation uh, from Professor Corinne Hosley from McGill University and Dr. Natalie Fekete uh, from uh, Saint Coban uh, Life Sciences. And uh, before starting uh, with their presentation, uh, just uh, like always, we have Q&A. Uh, please put your question in the Q&A box. And also there is a poll. You can take it to give us your feedbacks. Um, and for next week, we have uh, Professor Peter Zantra from uh, UBC, University of British Columbia. Uh, this, is the, this is a rescheduled uh, event. Last time, uh, uh, there, there was some uh, problem that he couldn't join us. And uh, please make sure to join us next week for his, his talk. Uh, for getting the updated information about the upcoming seminar, please follow us on uh, Twitter, the Translational Biomedical Engineering. And, uh, and lastly, I would like to thank uh, our sponsor, Montreal Transmit Tech Institute, for providing the opportunity and this platform to have this e-seminar series. And this, uh, this e-seminar, basically, it's a 47 seminar uh, almost a year uh, year ago we started this seminar series okay so by that i would uh, like to introduce our uh, speakers and it's my great pleasure uh, today to introduce professor hosley uh, uh, she's the head of the stem cell bioprocessing laboratory at mcgill university she is the biochemical uh, engineer with expertise in bioprocess development, high throughput screening, and the stem cell culture optimization. Her research aims to develop bioprocesses uh, to produce and transport uh, transplant therapeutic cells to treat diabetes and cardiovascular disease. She developed emulsion-based method to encapsulate uh, pancreatic islet cells. <clears throat> Her laboratory has also developed surface modification techniques to selectively capture flowing cells and promote their proliferation on the surfaces. Uh, these multifunctional surfaces show potential in improving the endothelialization of vascular biomaterials. Her emerging, uh, emerging leadership in bioengineering was recognized through the 2014 uh, Martin Sinacor Outstanding Young uh, Investigator Award from Engineering Conference International and Biogen IDEC, as well as the Etoile Effervescence uh, uh, Award from Montreal in vivo. Uh, current project in uh, diabetes uh, cellular therapy include engineering vascularized eyelid micro encapsulation devices using 3D printing and studying the effect of mechanical signals uh, on pluripotent stem cell differentiation into insulin uh, producing cells. Uh, and also, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Nathalie Fekete, uh, joined the life science R&D team at SGR North America in 2017 and is leading the life science laboratory in Worcester, Massachusetts. She obtained her PhD at the University of Ulm, Germany, for her work on GMP-compliant uh, mesenchymal stem cell expansion systems for cell therapy. She completed a uh, two postdoctoral fellowship in tissue engineering at the University of Twente in the Netherlands and uh, chemical engineering at um, uh, McGill University in Montreal, Canada, investigating cell surface interaction for cell manufacturing uh, prior to joining St. Goban company uh, in, in, in US. By that, uh, I would like to invite Professor Hosley to start her presentation. Thank you so much. You hear me, right? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Thanks. So, uh, thanks for that great introduction. I think it will make our own slides a little bit faster. Um, and we'll tell you a little bit about our seven year story of our collaboration with Sagabay Life Sciences in the next uh, 45 minutes. Um, and my screen is stuck. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay, so um, I'd like to start with uh, an introduction of how I got where I am as a professor, because I remember when I was a trainee, it was very difficult to envision the path to the academic career or other career paths. So I always found it inspiring what 
people talked about what they went through. So I did my uh, bachelor's at the University of Ottawa, both in biochemistry and chemical engineering. And one professor in particular inspired me when they were presenting about stem cells, uh, but I really cared about engineering. So then I looked across Canada, who works as an engineer for stem cell culture. And one of those laboratories was the lab of James Perret. Uh, at UBC, where I then worked on uh, diabetes. So this is where I got interested in cell encapsulation. But when you encapsulate cells to transplant them, for example, to protect them against immune rejection, uh, you run into mass transfer limitations because the tissues are not very well vascularized when you start off. And so I did my postdoctoral fellowship at Université Laval and in collaboration with Pfizer, and this was with uh, two supervisors, Gaetan Laroche and Alain Garnier, and I worked on vascular biomaterials at, during my postdoc. And then at McGill, I kind of combine all of these interests. And so if they made it, you end up with uh, my lab at McGill. And what we work on is a combination of these things where we uh, study stem cell expansion and production, especially of pancreatic cells to treat diabetes also vascular cells from the same stem cell populations. And as you culture these cells, it's very important to consider cell surface interactions. So this is what we'll talk about today with this presentation with Saigame. And uh, once we've produced the cells, we try to encapsulate them and deliver them, including engineering vascularized tissues. All right, thank you, Corinne. Uh, thank you again for the in uh, introduction and uh, invitation. Very pleased to be here. And congratulations to your one year anniversary of giving these um, very exciting seminars. Um, so my name is Natalie Fekete. I was born in Germany, um, received my PhD in uh, officially organic chemistry, but, but I'm a biologist by training. And my focus is cell therapy and the manufacturing of cells for clinical application. Um, during my PhD, and you can see my supervisor on the screen there, uh, Professor Schretzmeier, and we were really focusing on understanding the impact of the culture systems and the vessels on the performance of the cells, namely the MSCs that we were working with. And we noticed that the cells would age when they would spend too much time on the plastic. And we didn't really understand what the plastic was at the time. Uh, we just um, understood that there was something, some interaction happening. So after my PhD, I joined... Um, the lab of uh, Jan de Boer and Clemens van Blutersweig to understand the effect of surface topography and surface materials better on the, the performance of the cells. And they introduced me to the concept of materiomics, uh, which they wrote a book about and greatly inspired me to think about the interplay of the really complex nature of cells, surfaces, and the microenvironment that they're in. So I then joined uh, during my second postdoc, Corinne's lab in Montreal. I was her first postdoc there, um, helped establish the lab and a lot of the essays to understand cell surface interactions, which we'll talk about today. Uh, after my two year stint at uh, McGill, um, I think we all agree there was more to be done, more, more exciting research, more data to be produced. And so St. Cobain decided to open their own lab that I'm currently managing the life sciences lab in Worcester, Massachusetts. And I'm looking forward to talk about that more. So this, uh, you might wonder how we started up this uh, collaboration. And in fact, it was through a wonderful mentor, Geta Larache, that I had during my postdoc. So he knew I was starting up this new lab and uh, he had an ongoing collaboration with Segave, more on the materials engineering side. And when they contacted him to do this uh, new project uh, that was much more biology oriented, he essentially referred the company to me saying that, you know, this new prof just starting at McGill, she might be better suited for that project. And that was really uh, extremely uh, helpful when I was starting up my lab to have this initial industry collaboration. So I got actually contacted by Segabe and by Sarah Clark, even before my lab was opened or functional. <laughs> And I was very lucky to recruit Natalie as my first postdoc as instrumental in setting up my lab and the project. And apparently we did well enough to continue the project as a contract in 2017. So that was renewed during the contract with having a bit more experience as a prof, I realized we could really um, leverage 
um, the project and uh, include more partners in the project. And this is where we started up a collaboration with Kinear Pharma and the Cell Therapy Lab at the MUHC Research Institute with Pierre Laneville to uh, try to apply what we had found more on the fundamental side to a more clinical uh, direction. And that led to this consortium that we're now leading together with uh, Pierre Laneville and uh, Linda Pelletier at the MUHC, Kinear Pharma, uh, including uh, Chief Scientific Officer Michel Tremblay. And this is co-sponsored, supported by various research uh, governmental organizations, as you can see on the slide. And if you want to learn more about this consortium, you can click, you can look at that link, or you can just Google Hersley saint uh, consortium press release, and you'll find that press release that discusses the consortium. Yeah, so Saint-Gobain is uh, one of the world's leading industrial corporations. Uh, we're operating worldwide in over 70 countries, including Canada, and uh, have a lot of uh, employees worldwide working on the manufacturing, uh, R&D, and distribution of our products. Uh, we're one of the world's one top 100 innovators and also top employer. Um, you can see the, the sales profit over there. And I think um, one of the... Um, main forces or main business units um, is the life sciences business unit. So if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so within the markets that we're serving, uh, our original product, uh, if you Google St. Gobain, you'll find a lot of construction materials. Um, the original product was actually the glass mirrors in Versailles. Um, the company is 350 years old. It was founded by King Louis XIV uh, to build um, his um, yeah, the glass mirrors in Versailles. And I think 50% of the product is still the original. Uh, in addition to those um, building construction materials, uh, we have a high performance solutions unit of which the life sciences business is part of, uh, which is led by Gina Angus, our CEO. And if you want to move to the next slide, uh, here you'll see some of the assemblies and standalone components that we produce as part of the life sciences business. Um, the life sciences business is um, encompassing many products, many single use materials, and we're the experts in filling um, niches in everyday use, but also in critical care moments. Um, some of the brands you might be familiar with are C-Flex and Tygon, our tubing, um, but we also uh, produce filters, uh, a lot of connectors and parts to make custom assemblies. Um, in the single use systems space, we do a lot of bags, uh, bioprocess solution bags, as well as the cell and gene therapy products. And in the cell therapy offering that we um, provide, um, our bags are based on FEP fluorinated ethylene propylene. That's the contact uh, layer for all of the fluids. It's a single uh, film, um, has great properties in terms of being chemically, basically inert, no leachables, extractables. Um, it's transparent, which makes it really a good material to use for cell therapy applications. Uh, the bags are branded ViewLife for the culture of our cells and CryoSure for the preservation. And um, we have several types of, of culture bags, but here in cell, cell culture, suspension cell culture, and the new high, high permeability bag for uh, highly prolif proliferating cells. And our specialty is really in the ability to provide custom solutions. So we don't just make the bag, we are also able to custom manufacture and configure the ports, the tubing that is attached to the bags. Uh, we do use a proprietary laser welding process so virtually any design that you come up with, we can produce and make into a bag. So this also means that our products are scalable. Uh, we can start at one ML, um, minimal volume up to one liter or five liters. Um, and again, um, we use an open architecture design philosophy and have um, uh, a lot of very dedicated and, and excellent application engineers that can help you really look at your process and close that up. All right. So. Natalie just mentioned closing up the process. So what does that mean? So uh, most, most of you are familiar with these uh, polystyrene flasks and open systems that we use a lot during R&D in uh, cell culture engineering uh, or in uh, cell therapy production. And so conventional, traditional culture vessels actually, I mean, traditionally, historically, things were made out of glass, but then Eventually, there was a switch towards uh, polystyrene and disposable 
uh, culture vessels. And so broadly, the culture vessels that you buy today, they were made from polystyrene. And that polystyrene, if you don't modify it, it's hydrophobic. So you can uh, basically, for, for suspension cells, for cells that grow uh, without attachment, uh, those ones you would use the untreated polystyrene version. But then if you have anchorage dependent cells, you can then treat the polystyrene uh, with various different surface modifications, which I'll get back to. And then you can grow anchorage dependent cells on the polystyrene. And when you manipulate these flasks or petri dishes or six well plates, or well plates, uh, when you manipulate them, even though you're in the biosafety cabinet, as you manipulate, so you minimize the risks of contamination, still, every time you open it, there's a chance that something could enter into your process. So this is what is called functionally open. And on the other side, you could try to use a functionally closed system where basically uh, the handling would be done without opening the system. So this could be done, for example, using a back system and connectors um, or tubing that is directly connected or that you can weld together. So that, let's say you take a sample from a patient, you can uh, process it through tubing, put it into the bag, change the medium again through pumping and tubing and back connectors. And then ultimately, the goal could be to have a needle to needle close process where basically everything is done without opening to air at any given time or to basically always have filters or materials that impede any kind of uh, uh, microorganism or contaminant entering your process. Um, so one of those uh, systems is these fluoropolymer bags made by Saigobe and just like the polystyrene they're also hydrophobic and they're very inert. So think about, you know, Teflon essentially, uh, but you can still functionalize it. You can still treat it to make it uh, compatible with anchorage dependent cells. So this is a quite interesting technology, but as you can imagine, when you switch from one type of culture to the other, when you're trying to switch from an open process to a closed process, especially when you transition more towards the clinic, this is highly, highly desirable uh, from the Health Canada or FDA standpoint because you reduce the risks of contamination and you increase the reproducibility of your manufacturing because things can be more automated. Um, as you do that, there's other changes that you're introducing right in your process because the bags and the flasks, they're not the same. They're not the same material. They don't have the same properties in terms of the mechanical, the stiffness of your substrate. Uh, they don't have the same uh, water permeability, gas permeability. Um, so these are things to consider when you do that transition. And this paper that was written by Natalie is extremely good at uh, reviewing some of the things you might consider when you do that transition, especially in the context of uh, monocyte derived dendritic cell production, which we'll present towards the end of the talk. So this is where this project started. Basically, we wanted to understand cell surface interactions and how they change between the polystyrene surfaces in these open culture vessels and what happens on the FEP surfaces with or without surface treatments. So what you see on this little schematic is basically you've got the substrate and then you can apply a treatment that may introduce functional groups like for example in this little cartoon you've got oxygen moieties might also have uh, nitrogen uh, kind of moieties so you could have carboxylic acid groups uh, amine groups and other groups depending on the treatment that you're adding and then after that depending on what surface you're working with whether it's the untreated or the treated surface and what type of treatment you're applying that's going to change the proteins that absorb and how they absorb on the surface. And then in turn, that will change cell surface interactions, right? So the way we see this project is really four steps. So the first step is studying the surface treatments that are applied. And this is in collaboration with Pierre-Luc Gérard Loriot in the plasma processing lab at McGill University. Second step, we're looking at protein absorption um, and this was in collaboration with Natalie Frenchy at McGill as well. 
And then we look at cell surface interaction, cell adhesion, but also cell fate decisions uh, based on what happens in those initial steps and subsequently. So I'm gonna focus more on steps two to four, but we're also modifying different surfaces, FUP surfaces in step number one. Okay, so let's do a quick overview of step number one. And I thought this would be interesting to this audience because when you select the culture material that you're going to use, you're changing the surface properties. And many people that work more on the cell biology side may not be that aware of the differences between different plastic surfaces. You know, one plastic is not the same as the other plastic. So first of all, there's a broad separation between untreated polystyrene and treated polystyrene. So the treated polystyrene can be oxygen rich or nitrogen rich and the different manufacturers. So we don't mean to be exclusive here. We just picked some of the most common brands to analyze. And so this is not published yet, but this is quite interesting data that we plan to publish shortly, uh, where basically you can see the elemental composition, which we acquired via X-ray uh, photoelectron spectroscopy, so XPS. And so when you look at the untreated polystyrene, it's not surprising that the different brands are pretty similar. But then when you get to the oxygen rich surfaces, you can see slight differences in the oxygen content on those surfaces. Then when you get to the nitrogen rich surfaces, which are generally uh, sold as uh, for more fastidious, difficult to culture primary cells. So for example, the Sarsted cell plus surfaces or the Corning primaria surfaces, those surfaces actually have both nitrogen content and also oxygen content, but it will change the surface charge on your plastic. And then finally, there are certain surfaces that are, uh, Carb they, they are sold as carboxyl rich or amine rich or cell bind. And what we found on those surfaces, at least in our hands, is that they had different, very different compositions. And uh, those are generally generated more by a kind of a polymer deposition on the surface uh, in our interpretation. So again, this is the data we acquired. Uh, we're not, you know, um, advertising that this is what you're going to get when you buy a certain brand, but you should be conscious that depending on the brand and the cell surface you're buying, you're getting different surface composition. And that also changes the water contact angle on your surface. And generally it's thought that lower contact angles, so basically when the water can spread more, your surface is more hydrophilic, that can be better for more fastidious uh, cells that uh, need anchorage to survive on the surface. Then these properties also change the protein absorption, right? So depending on the surface charge and the wettability, you're going to change how the proteins absorb on the surface. So one way to study that is to uh, use this technique uh, called quartz crystal microbalance with dissipation monitoring, QCMD. So we've published a paper comparing fluoropolymer AF1600 with polystyrene, and this is untreated. So these are you know, this would be for the uh, suspension culture cells. And we looked at the dynamics of protein absorption. So how fast proteins absorb and which protein absorb and how to absorb on the surface. So again, if you wanna read more, you can look at this paper down here. But one thing that was very interesting is that you can see that within six minutes, you've got the proteins more or less reaching a not quite yet, but you've got most of the protein absorption happening within six minutes. So this is something to keep in mind when you seed your cells, six minutes later, that protein layer is more or less established. It will remodel over time, but anyways, uh, and you can see the change in topography. This is by uh, AFM. And what was quite interesting with the QCMD, we could look at the mechanical properties of the adsorbed protein layer. And based on those uh, adsorption profiles, what we could see is that most likely albumin, which is in high concentration in many uh, culture media, especially the uh, uh, serum-free media, but also in the serum-containing media, but in the medium we used, uh, we saw the formation of a double layer of albumin. So probably albumin, most of the first layer and also the second layer on the surface is mostly composed of albumin 
And there, there appears to be a, a second layer of albumin absorbing on top of that first layer. So that was quite interesting. And that protein layer impacts cell adhesion. Um, so depending on whether you have different surface treatments, different charge, you're going to get very different adhesion profiles. And this is just to show you the huge difference in, the huge difference in morphology that you can get on these different surfaces. So for example, on untreated polystyrene and on untreated fluoropolymer, oops, so untreated, um, uh, uh, so sorry, this is treated polystyrene. So this is for anchorage dependent cells and this is treated FEP. So the view life uh, adherent culture series bags, you can see that the cells HEC293 uh, mouse and Saloma 6 or human mesenchymal stem stromal, slash stromal cells, they can adhere on these surfaces, but obviously they're not adhering very well on these uh, uh, untreated FEP surfaces, which is not surprising. It's really what you would expect. And what was, however, a little less expected was that depending on the surface that you're using, it can change some of the integrin expression by the cell. So the integrins are proteins that span the membrane that are involved in adhesion or interactions with extracellular matrix proteins. And we found that depending on whether we culture the cells on tissue culture polystyrene, this is uh, treated. So it's the SARSTED uh, standard surface. So this is an oxygen rich surface. And the adherent culture version of the FEP bags the, there would be slight differences in the integrin expression levels by the different, uh, by the HMSCs in these different conditions. We then wanted to look at the adhesion mechanisms and integrins rely a lot on having calcium in them to be able to uh, be, have their proper conformation and interaction with uh, extracellular matrix proteins. So, one way to look at whether integrins are involved in the adhesion processes is to use EDTA to chelate divalent cations like magnesium and calcium. And so uh, it's not really surprising to see that in complete medium, when you add more EDTA, you see a drastic decrease in the cell adhesion on the surfaces. But what was more surprising is that the EDTA also seemed to interfere to some extent with cell adhesion without proteins present in the medium. So even though there's no proteins theoretically absorbing on the surface, or at least there's no proteins in the medium, adding the EDTA would still interfere with the adhesion. And there was a surprising number of cells that adhered onto the surfaces even without proteins present. So that was very, very interesting in this case, and we're continuing to study that phenomenon. And then finally, we're getting into the cell fate decisions as well. So depending on how the cells are there, it also may change what decisions they make later. And this is where Natalie's project as a postdoc actually started. So for cancer immunotherapy, um, the monocyte derived dendritic cells were really the main cell type of interest um, when I started my postdoc. Um, those cells are unique in the immune uh, response as they are able to um, switch between the uh, innate and adaptive immune response and activate T cells very specifically to alert them to a cancer or any inv invading pathogen um, that the T cells should be aware of. And so, uh, as Corinne mentioned, ideally for cell therapy manufacturing, we're using a needle to needle process. That means we're starting with a needle, we're getting an RFRESIS product from the patient um, or the donor. We're isolating our cell type of interest, in this case, the monocytes. Um, and then we activate um, those monocytes and start to induce the maturation and differentiation of the uh, monocytes into first immature dendritic cells and then mature dendritic cells. Finally, the cell product would be purified, concentrated, and infused back into the patient um, to start uh, the, the immune response. 
Now in the lab, again, we're using a cell culture protocol that is shown here. The one that I used was a nine day protocol, starting with the uh, stimulation of the monocytes with GM, CSF and IL-4 to differentiate into immature dendritic cells. And in along this process, the cells uh, lose this, the expression of CD14 and start, um, start the expression of dendritic cell specific markers, including CD80, 86, 83, and the ones listed here. You can then mature those cells in the final two days of culture. Uh, we used LPS and TNF alpha in the lab uh, at McGill. That uh, is what we found was very potent and very um, efficient. However, in the clinical process, you would probably use a different type of cytokine cocktail, ideally also tumor-derived antigens to specifically trigger those cells to mature. And then um, we cultured those cells in either the um, six-fold plates or the bags that you can see in the photo. And um, Corinne, if you want to advance to the next slide, thank you. Um, then you can see that we uh, tested uh, the differentiation of monocytes into DCs um, in various volumes and compared TCPS culture to FEP culture. Um, again, with uh, the ability to really downscale the size and the volume of the experiments to 1 ml, 2 ml, and 7, uh, 7 ml, we were able to really uh, compare and do some high throughput screening of various cultures in the bags. Um, there was no significant difference in the percentage of viable cells obtained after culture um, and also in the viability um, over time. And then on the next slide, you can also see the uh, respective surface marker expression. So all of the markers shown here are specific for monocyte-derived dendritic cells. CD14 expression overall decreases over time, um, while the CD40, CD80, and 83, and 86 uh, are either upregulated or maintained at high levels. And what you want to note is that throughout the culture, day two, day seven, and day nine, there was no significant difference between the cultures done on FEP or in TCPS, which was the goal of this um, exercise. So again, you can switch from bags, from flasks to bags, um, but the surface um, expression profile should remain the same. After that initial um, project, uh, we reached out to our uh, collaborators then at Maisonneuve Osmond Hospital in uh, Montreal. Uh, Jean-Philippe Bastien was uh, the postdoc there at the time, uh, working in Denis Claude Roy's group. And he was really interested in the idea of culturing uh, modices in bags to activate T cells. Um, they're focusing on T cell specific uh, clinical application, and they're using the dendritic cells to activate the T cells. And so he did a very similar culture, um, comparing um, DC production in the TCPS plate and then in the FEP bag. As you can see uh, from the red and blue line on the top figure, um, they really align very closely. And so the number of cells produced was the same. And then we're looking at the functional capacity of those cells uh, by pulsing um, the uh, MODCs, so exposing them to the peptide antigen. Um, then if you compare the flow cytometry, um, dot plots from the pulse cells of the DCs cultured in the TCPS plate and the DC is cultured in the FEP bag, you can see that the um, scatter plots are very comparable and that the number of cells that uh, were obtained were also uh, very comparable. Um, importantly, uh, they then did a tetramer staining and found that the pulse cells were actually also the ones specific to the antigen and the ones that they wanted um, in their assay. Um, so again, equivalent production of the pulsed uh, T cells in both the plates and the bags. So this led into this collaboration uh, with Canier Pharma. So Canier Pharma is a startup company uh, co-founded by Michel Tremblay. Um, uh, Michel L. Tremblay, if you want to look him up at McGill University. And uh, they have this kit called Immunir. So Immunir contains, um, you know, uh, maturation factors for dendritic cells, but it also includes K885. So K885 is a proprietary small molecule, and it's a uh, protein tyrosine phosphatase inhibitor that helps in this uh, maturation of the dendritic cells and it will help produce dendritic cells that are that have a uh, very good function uh, especially in the ter in um, uh, in terms of il12 uh, production and so those dendritic cells should be a lot better at uh, activating this immune response when you re-inject them into the patient and the idea behind the immune kit is really to have a Per, per, per patient kit where basically you would have a tumor associated antigen from the patient, 
uh, you would have the Immuner kit and you would have it all into uh, one kind of simple production process that you could do in hospital to uh, basically treat cancers. Uh, for example, chronic myelogenic leukemia, which is what we're working on with Kinear Pharma. And in this situation, the bags are really a great advantage because you could do all of this processing on a per patient scale out basis where uh, you have the bags, the immuner kit in one kind of uh, combined kit uh, for one patient in the clinic. And so that's that's what led to this uh, collaboration that we're working on now, where we're looking at the different bags, also in continued collaboration with uh, Pierre-Luc gérard in the Plasma Processing Lab, where we're looking at uh, how we can combine the bags with the immunor kit uh, with and without su different surface treatments for cancer immunotherapy. We thought we'd spend some time to talk about how our collaboration works because it's really a, been a wonderful experience since I started my lab uh, working with Cytomay Life Sciences. It's a very open and uh, collegial collaboration where ideas flow both ways. And so this has been a really uh, an amazing industry collaboration. And we wanted to highlight some of the things that we're doing that we think makes it work so well. And the first thing really is communication. So we have biweekly progress updates again, where you know my trainees will present their work and they'll present their ideas, but we'll also get ideas from the Sangabe team. So this is really fantastic. That also leads to co-authorship on papers. And when there is problems that arise, which happens as in any relationship, or uh, if, you, if you're in a couple, you know that the number one key thing to making it work is communication. So that's extremely important in this relationship. We obviously started off each contract and each uh, project with a comprehensive agreement on intellectual property, but also what is expected for trainee, um, let's say publications. So trainees can publish, but there are certain uh, time spans during which the company will examine things for IP. And so this is very important to start off with a very clear understanding not just on my side and side my side, but also for the trainees, they need to also understand what uh, the terms are of those agreements. And uh, as Corinne mentioned, uh, authorship and publications is one of those things that we expect as output and that we like to see. Um, the collaboration so far has been very fruitful, very productive. We've, uh, as you've shown on the slides, had multiple uh, publications. There's posters, abstract for conferences. Um, so there's a lot to show of the fundamental learnings that we have so far. Uh, essays have been established. We are generating protocols and data and like to showcase that as well. Uh, for us as a company, I think it's a lot of learning on how to, what options there are for surface modifications and understanding the complex interplay of the protein adsorption and cell adhesion better on a fundamental as well as on an applied scale. Um, obviously, uh, trusting each other and being very open-minded and upfront about any concerns that we have and uh, being able to really troubleshoot any issues together is fundamental and, and key to success. Um, and the trainees, as Corinne mentioned, um, do profit from the industrial collaboration by seeing how products are run, how products are being formed in an industrial environment with a view towards business impact and commercial use. So, um, plus we again profit from having those young bright minds and um, understanding their input and taking that in and their enthusiasm and their motivation to, to be part of cell therapy and be part of new product development as well. So I think it's been really beneficial for both sides. Um, and um, if you have any questions about this, of course, um, feel free to post them in the chat below. Yes, and I think part of the mutual trust as well is that you might be surprised, but my trainees show a lot of negative results. <laughs> and when they struggle, they share it with the company. And it's actually beneficial to this collaboration and the trust that we have to show those things because those are efforts that don't need to be repeated again later. So this is something to keep in mind if you're working with an industry partner. It, this can be negative results. I know in the academic field, uh, it can be difficult to publish them, but in this collaboration has been really useful to share those. And amongst the opportunities for trainees, we also have the MITACS internships, which you might have noticed on the previous slide, 
which are very useful in uh, having uh, in-person experience. So we even have, you know, in-person exchanges, except when there's COVID, of course, but this is very useful to really get the experience of how it works in industry. And this is uh, some of the trainees. I'm not showing all of them because this has been a seven year journey. So I didn't show all of the undergraduate students and even the graduate students that contributed, but I'm showing the current team and some of the very recent team members. So one of those was Gatsavetsi, who worked a lot on the uh, plasma treatment and cell surface interactions. Nebeze, so um, Gatsavetsi is now at Axelis, and he's uh, a lot more on the kind of intellectual property and uh, um, uh, business side of things. Nebiz Zaidan is a postdoc that recently uh, was recruited by Notch Therapeutics, so he's working there now. Uh, he worked; he was he's an immunologist, so he worked on more of the monocyte dendritic cell differentiation part. He gave a lot of advice to the other trainees that are engineers, like Olivia Bowden, Jessica Tian, uh, and Badaji Ramakandran. So Badaji is a postdoc working on plasma treatments with Pialik. Jessica and Olivia both work both on the plasma treatment side and on the cell adhesion side. And of course, our collaborators at the MUHC, Kenyar Pharma, and uh, at the at the Maison de Rosemont, and at the saint -Gobain. So I didn't label it here, but you see uh, Katie Campbell here, who's part of the team, uh, Sarah Clark, who started off the 2014 project and other members of saint uh, that participated uh, very, uh, had a big contribution to this project. And then finally, uh, funding agencies. So I'm including the current project partners that are on this consortium, uh, but also this is supported by funding from MedTech and CERC, MyTax and the CFI, uh, but also uh, wonderful research networks that give opportunities for uh, travel awards and networking uh, meetings, uh, functional expertise on functional materials, cell therapy, proteins, and uh, other support to my trainees. And with that, we are concluding, and we're going to go back to this slide because we think that this might be an interesting starting point for the um, uh, the the um, uh, let's say a conversation that we're going to have now at the end of the presentation. Well, thank you very much, uh, Corinne and uh, Natalie, for your uh, very interesting and very inspiring uh, presentation. It's, uh, it seems that you folks have been working together for a long time, and then that clearly demonstrates the the trust that you established between between uh, each other. So that's very very uh, uh, you know inspiring. Uh, so I encourage the participants to uh, ask their questions in the ask a question box. Uh, so while you folks are uh, you know taking a breath and then uh, getting ready for the questions. Uh, I'd like to announce that our uh, next speaker is Professor Peter Zanstra from uh, University of British Columbia next week. Make sure that you follow us on uh, Twitter uh, to get uh, the most up-to-date information about these e uh, seminar series. Uh, so uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to start with the questions from the uh, uh, from the audience. Uh, of course, Mike Callos is the first. Uh, one who asked the question, and uh, I kind of expected this question from you, Mike. So, uh, would be interested in the same analysis for microcarriers and their surfaces. Will your technique work for pla particles? So, either of you can. Well, can answer the I think I think in terms of the plasma treatments, it's, it can be a little bit tricky. The ones that we're developing to uh, apply them. Uh, uniformly on 3D surfaces, but I know Professor Javalario has published at least one paper on that. Um, but I think, uh, you know, it might be more, it, it could be also chemical methods that you're going to apply, but it's not exclusive. It's not excluded to use uh, plasma treatments to generate functionalized microcarriers. Maybe to add to that. So um, Corning is 
famous, of course, for their cell culture surface treatment, as there are many others in the space. Um, and they do, on purpose, apply the same treatments, whether it's the cell bind or Synthamax um, surface treatment that you know and are familiar with from your uh, tea flask cultures to their microcarriers. Um, so ideally, those would match. Of course, microcarriers are slightly different in their behavior and in the culture overall. Uh, again, the cells are mechanically responsive. They will feel the surface and there might be slight differences, but the goal is to keep things homogenous and to be able to translate um, from flask to microcarriers, ideally in bags uh, for commercial cell production. Cool. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, so the next question is uh, from Honer. I hope you, I pronounced your name uh, correctly. So thanks for the great talk. Do you also study how the surface topography besides composition change surface cell interactions? We, uh, so we look at the topography. For now, we haven't modified it on purpose to uh, tailor it, but it's something we have discussed at length and uh, ended up not investigating yet, but it's definitely a parameter that we're quite aware of. So what we do currently is just look at the topography before and after different treatments and then, um, you know, uh, include, uh, let's say, roughness as a parameter in our considerations, but it's not something that we've purposely modified to then look at the effect in the context of the back cultures. Yeah. Topography, I think, is a fascinating subject because it influences so much. Uh, topography on its own can lead to cell adhesion or prevent it entirely. I think the lotus leaf is a famous uh, example for what topography can do in nature. And in terms of cell culture surface, um, topography definitely plays a role. Um, again, adherent cells, especially cells like MSCs, like to be more in a 3D type of culture environment. I think we've learned that over the years. And topography, whether it's f formation of pillars on the surface or just having giving the cells a 3D structure to adhere to and to uh, function as it physiologically would, is a great advantage. Ha as we learned, proteins quickly absorb to the surface and basically cover the surface within minutes of adding the cell culture media to the surface. So if you're on a nanotopography scale, probably a lot of that nanotopography would be immediately covered by albumin and, and other factors that are present in the media. So you really have to look at microtopography on that level and then ensure that it is interesting and of use to the cells. And it's very complex, so we haven't gotten there yet, but it's definitely something to keep in mind. Thank you very much. So I have a follow-up question on that topic. Uh, so, so uh, Corinne, you mentioned that you measure the surface topography of treated uh, uh, material substrates. So have you noticed any significant change between the different, you know, batch to batch uh, uh, treated, uh, uh, you know, surfaces? I don't know if I can quantitatively answer that question i would almost have to refer you to my postdoc that's <laughs> that's yeah. done those measurements okay. but um i don't think the topography changes drastically from batch to batch uh what i think and and as natalie pointed out when you when you add that protein layer you saw that if image image with and without the uh, the culture medium it's, you know it completely hides the nanotopography so as far as I understand, you know, even the small variations that mean might be introduced during the plasma treatments, they are then covered by this albumin or other protein layer. So I assume it wasn't very important that it didn't caught your eye. So I think uh, otherwise you would have seen some differences, right? <laughs> so well, it's, we, can, it's can... very... It, it's been very, uh, I mean, it's surprisingly reproducible. I think the cell yeah. seeding, the cell donor, that that variability is way higher than the variability we get on our surfaces in terms That's of the it. outcome. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Whatever changes that we see is probably, you know, filtered out. Uh, and then you don't see it. So that's 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 great. Well, what I what can what I can tell is we do see variability sometimes when we get things from certain manufacturers. Like I don't know if you notice the air bars, on um, depending depending on which functionalization. But you know the air bars on the XPS data I showed you, 
some of them mm -hmm. are higher and i as i recall some of them are higher on the polymerization surfaces and i think that's just intrinsic stability of the polymerized layer uh, it can be very mm -hmm. difficult to have a stable layer before and after sterilization and uh, on follow up on that there is also aging you don't know when uh, you get these uh, plastics yeah. how long they were they were uh, in the storage room or so there is aging on that. Yeah, and it, I, well, maybe Natalie, you want to talk about that? We've studied aging quite extensively. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think uh, it's good. I mean, uh, I, I'm interested to know because part of my project in PhD was plasma polymerization and, uh, you know, investigating aging. So we had agings all the time. So uh, if Natalie can elaborate a little bit more. Thank I you. think um, so. Every manufacturer will have their own specific process and their own way of producing those surfaces, uh, both the, for extrusion of the main material as well as the surface treatment. And depending on the manufacturer and their process, that may end up in a more com like homogenous surface versus others. I I've definitely seen differences between different suppliers. Um, I've also noticed differences when in looking at the protein absorption. Again, those AFM pictures you've, you've seen, we've definitely seen differences in sort of patchy looking surfaces where clearly on, on some parts of the surface there would be protein absorption and it would look completely different on other areas of the surface. Uh, whether that's due to the assay that we run or the surface itself, again, the surface roughness, the the chemistry that's underlying the material surface itself may not be all the way homogenous, but it's very much dependent on the process that is used to manufacture that. And, and I, current, yeah. I, I think, um, I think you, this is something to like a take home message for the trainees. Um, this is something that we don't often study or consider uh, when we do our cell biology or stem cell cultures, you know, um, but we really have to be aware of the, you know, lot to lot variability, the between manufacturer variability that you are encountering and how it contributes to your findings and make sure to mention it in your papers. When you publish, mention which manufacturer, um, which brand of plastic that you use, because that can contribute to the lack of reproducibility in scientific data. Yeah, some journals are moving towards that direction. So they request to have like all those numbers on the materials and methods, which is, I think, I think it's good. Not, not only this uh, surface is also the materials and chemicals that you purchase uh, is, uh, is also very important. Uh, so well, uh, uh, so great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so my, uh, so let's go to the next question. I also, uh, uh, so from Mike, uh, uh, so uh, uh, looks like a great industry academia collaboration however not all companies are as interested in publishing for example smaller startups uh, 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 publishing papers which is something that is needed for like uh, uh, those who work in academia any strategies for this have you encountered this Natalie, do you want to talk about that? <laughs> um, so IP is definitely something that any company, any business will want to protect. Um, we're very cautious and, of course, uh, interested in protecting our own IP and any new IP that's generated. So we're in R&D. Uh, this is a university academic uh, collaboration. Of course, students will uh, find new uh, sort of context and find new results and generate new data and develop something new. That's the goal is to, to learn something new, to develop something new together. Whether that is published in a paper or protected in the form of a patent application is really up to us. Um, we generally look at any new development, any new IP that's generated and ask ourselves, okay, how do we want to go about this? Is this something we want to protect in terms of being able to manufacture a product out of it? Or is this something that's more, maybe more fundamental learning that we want to share with the world and can share with the world in terms of an academic publication, a poster, et cetera. So it really depends on what, what it is that we have found, what it is that we have developed to make the, the decision going forward. And I think it's in the interest also of the university to have IP, to have uh, patents if, uh, if possible. Um, in, our, in our case, we have something that uh, was discovered by McGill and we have the opportunity to license it 
to manufacture it into one of our products. Um, and so, yes, for startup companies, I completely understand it's uh, important to generate and protect IP. That's a, a big part of your business. And we fully understand. And again, it's nice to have publications. It gives great visibility. Uh, it gives the students an opportunity to present, to uh, go to conferences, to share information, to get their names out there. Uh, at the same time, for us as a company, it's just as important to also gain and protect our people. And I'd say that one trick in this collaboration has been that there's always been, even, even the projects that led to this uh, IP, even in those projects, there were components that were fundamental. And so the trainees, none of the trainees were impeded from publishing or presenting data that was more on the fundamental side. So we gained this understanding of protein absorption, of uh, you know cell adhesion, and so those portions can be published. And I think that was from the outset, Saint Gobain really directed the project to be that way, to have that fundamental component, so which kept the publication opportunity. As a company, I think we're generally very interested in learning and sharing our knowledge in that field of how to use the application, how to do cell culture, tips and tricks, how to go from flask to bags, how to close up your system and have success in the way to commercial application of, uh, of your process and your product, whichever that may be. And so there's a lot of learning that I think we're very interested in sharing um, just because it makes everyone's lives easier. And we're all used to working on polystyrene T-flasks. We all, that those that do go into the clinics need to close up the system. And so how do you do that? What can you expect in terms of changes in the microenvironment of the cells, how they will behave and respond to the new environment? These are fundamental aspects that I think we're happy to share to make everyone's lives easier and give access to a broad range of uh, people out there, whether it's academic groups or other customers um, to be able to, to go along this process efficiently. Um, in terms of other IP, yes, there's things we want to protect, but I think, um, again, this collaboration was set up with that in mind. And it's important to discuss that from the outset. Uh, as an academic, when this company approaches you, you know, tell them, well, it's going to be important for my students to publish, so can we shield off this portion of the project that can be publishable? All right. Thanks, Mike, for the questions. <laughs> <laughs> and I have also a follow-up question about IP and then the arrangements. Uh, so can you, uh, uh, you know, elaborate more uh, on, 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 on your arrangement, if possible, on uh, the IP arrangement in terms of the background IPs and then the foreground IPs and maybe maybe how do you usually manage that? in terms of these kinds of collaboration because that's something that usually comes up when you start you know collaborating with with, uh, with companies pierre Luc and i declared our background ip that's for the first thing <laughs> and then the rest i think natalie probably knows better than i what i were allowed to discuss or not <laughs> um so in the agreement that we have the uh, ip is shared um and uh, is protected so the uh, there is background IP that is being um, discussed and that is being protected again on the McGill side as well as on the St. Cobain side in terms of new IP um, is being discussed and reviewed um, how we want to proceed with protecting it. Um, again, there are it depends on the applications of the invention itself. Is it something that St. Cobain would be able to utilize in our manufacturing process? Like, is this a new product that we want to use? Or is this maybe related to like plasma modifications in general or cell surface interactions that's part of the protocol? Um, something mm -hmm. that maybe, uh, you know, would have a, a different impact on maybe not directly related to the ability to manufacture. So it depends. And uh, Kinear Pharma also had, you know, there there was a separation between the IP that would go to Kinear Pharma and, and Saigabe. Uh, because, but that was important because the companies have very, you know, uh, complementary portfolios. They don't have much overlap. So there was, but anyway, we had to discuss what would belong to you, each company in which context. That I, makes things complicated in this kind of consortium. I, I can imagine that uh, even, yeah. I think you get I used to it. Bodies, that's the complicated <laughs> but it's, I think you get no, used again, to I mean, it. In terms of like the paperwork, yeah. The paperwork and the level of agreements and everything, because now you have uh, three parties yeah. and then. Honestly, yeah. this agreement wasn't difficult to negotiate on my side. I don't know your side, Natalie, but it was pretty straightforward. 
in, okay. as, as straightforward as it could be. But that was maybe because we had two past agreements. That's okay. Yeah. We have a uh, good practice. And I think, again, having an upfront discussion is useful, who does what. And then in our case, it honestly is fairly straightforward. We're looking at um, the progress and the, you know, the invention, if there is an invention and, and have a discussion on who does what, how do we want to proceed with it? And then the paperwork is the paperwork that is being processed, of course. And again, one of the advantages of working with a large corporation like St. Gobain or like McGill University as well, a large institute, is that we have dedicated teams and people that do this um, on a daily basis. So it's not up to us personally to, to having to do this ourselves. Um, it's really just passing it on and having it processed about it through the teams uh, who are of course the experts. And I think it's very helpful to have their guidance as well on how do we look at this? What are the opportunities or the options for us here um, and, and get their guidance as well. So, yeah. Uh, Uman, do you have a question? No. Uh, um, not related to IP, but uh, just uh, was curious that if you apply this uh, plasma polymerized coating or was it plasma polymerized coating or was it surface modification? No, there were, a, well, little, I mean, a little bit of both, but yes, it's plasma polymer coating. So, uh, uh, so, you know, you, you can read the publications from Pierre-Luc Gérard Lorient, and yeah. we, use, we, we use very similar technology, and we've shown that in conference abstracts, so it's not, you know, uh, a secret. We've, we've shown that at uh, CBS conferences, if you look at past abstracts. No, yeah. I'm just wondering. You apply it on the bags too, and uh, yeah, well, on FEP films. So uh, oh, okay. I'm, yeah. uh, I'm I'm imagining that these bags are uh, semi permeable to oxygen or or nitrogen or other. So, did you also study the 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 membrane, not the barrier properties of the plasma polymerized coatings on these bags or on the on the sheets? Yeah. So the film itself is gas permeable. Yes, that's one of the main advantages. It is uh, permissive for oxygen, CO2, all the gases, which is, of course, essential for cell culture that you can have the exchange of oxygen and then waste product CO2 out. Um, in terms of the plasma polymer coated surfaces, um, we have not done any study on the gas permeability effect of having those um, coatings on the FEP yet. I think that's something that we definitely would consider uh, doing, obviously, for the commercial application. Um, and uh, getting the right, the micro environment right and the gas exchange correct and, and adjusted for each cell type is definitely one of the things that we've learned in the past few years, which is why we developed the high permeability bag that has higher gas uh, trans, um, ga gas permission rates. Um, and so um, it's definitely something that we are keeping an eye on because uh, we have seen that gas um, uh, transfer can be the, the rate limiting step and we don't want it to be that uh, if we can prevent it to be that. Thank you, I, don't, I don't anticipate that very, very thin plasma polymer coating to impede the gas permeability, but we, we we could chuck. Yeah. I don't think so, but I was wondering, you know, like, uh, mm -hmm. because some, you know, uh, when I was uh, using those uh, for electrospun fibers or mat, I see that they can penetrate inside. Sometimes they can block the some of the pores, small pores, you know, not really like, but, yeah. but it's something that it's a, I mean, I remember I was attending a conference that people are trying to measure also uh, permeability or barrier properties of these functional coatings. So it's... Uh, I think it's, we could easily do it or not. It yeah. could be a good idea, but again, like I don't anticipate any effect, but maybe we should verify. <laughs> yeah, so probably Pierre Luke is more interested on that. <laughs> so, so. Okay, Mosa, I pass to you. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, so uh, we have another question from the audience, Tian Tian. Uh, so thanks a lot for uh, this great presentation. Uh, so the question is more about, uh, you know, the rationale for using polymer-based substrates. So why not using glass or ceramics rather than polymers for cell culture? Who wants I to go first? I'm, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll get started. So in the uh, in the single use world, um, plastic polymers are still the standard uh, material to use. Again, a lot. It's 
cell culture started on glass and then transitioned to polystyrene because it is a single use system. Um, it's we have a lot of experience with culturing various cell types on polystyrene, whether it's suspension cells or adherent cells. There's more than 70 years of publications uh, where people have looked at cell surface interactions and how to efficiently propagate cells in, in the dish. Um, I think now we're learning a little bit more about polystyrene itself and this different surface treatments. Myself as a biologist, I definitely um, learned a lot in the last few years about the different surface treatments and how that the, the stiffness, the topography, all of these factors, how they impact cell fate in, in vitro. And when we're looking at commercial application, again, these are patient-specific therapies. We're talking about having an autologous or an allogeneic setting where single use is still the preferred um, system or the sim preferred way to go, just because of risk and safety precautions overall. The polymer that we are currently using is a fluor polymer, um, so FEP. Um, other people use different polymers for their bags. Again, the cells are alive, they're mechanically responsive, they will respond to their environment. And I think we're trying to modulate the stiffness and the properties of the material, the surface itself, to the cell type of interest and what they need in their culture to uh, expand efficiently, differentiate, activate efficiently, and be the most potent cell product that we can make and deliver to the patient. And again, polystyrene uh, is like the go-to, has been the go-to. And so it is still the, the material of choice for many uh, clinical trials at the moment. Cool. I don't, think I, have much, I don't think I have much to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's good. Uh, so I have, uh, let's, let's see, I have a, a, a few other questions, but let's see, Mike have also before he, left he had another follow-up question uh, that uh, I mean I mean uh, what are the have you have you studied the like you know things like contact angle elemental composition etc mm -hmm. or, or yeah. even were they very important for you yes they're they're um, so we in certain cases we even tried to quantify the surface free energy not just by water contact angle, but other solvents. But when you put some of these solvents on polystyrene, <laughs> polystyrene dissolves. So uh, it was actually easier to do that on the FEP. Um, but yes, we, we've looked at the surface uh, for energy. Um, this All of these parameters are very important for how proteins will absorb, uh, um, uh, how much and, and the conformation, their availability for cell binding. Um, we tried, to, what was quite challenging was looking at which proteins absorb. Um, I think, uh, so we, you know, we did, we use techniques like ELISA, mass spectrometry, but still, it's still quite difficult to look at the composition of that absorbed protein layer when you're using media that are not fully defined. So this is, this is a, I would say a challenge, at least for us. Um, but, um, We've we've looked at correlations between all of these parameters and the solid adhesion. Okay. Okay, awesome. that's I good. Do have a question. You do? Yes. Okay, go so, ahead. So in, in basically in this project you wanted to have a material to absorb the protein and then uh, maintain the adhesion of the cells and so but well, no, it was almost more like fundamental. We wanted to understand what makes cells tick, you know, um, with different cell types. So we've, as you saw, we, well, the, the two main cell types we've been looking at is uh, uh, mesenchymal stem stromal cells and uh, monocyte derived dendritic cells. But what we were trying to get at, because these different cell types, they don't have the same anchorage dependence. So the HMSCs are anchorage dependent monocytes. They can anchor to substrates, but they can also be happy in suspension. And so we were trying to look at fundamentally how they adhere, why they adhere, what can we make to the surface to uh, alter that behavior. And uh, the adhere, uh, adhesion is cell dependent and uh, so these kind of things. But, uh, you know, my question is a bit out of your project, uh, kind of, you know, because you studied material, FEP, polystyrene, and other things. In field of organ and cheap, most of the people use uh, PDMS, and mm -hmm. they have this they have this problem of uh, a smart molecule adsorption and uh, drug adsorption. Have you, you no? Know, I mean, in your research, have you come with the idea of uh, 
you know, an, a material that can be used instead of EDMS, for example, in organ on the chip? Or do you have, do you know of any material? I don't think we've stumbled upon that. We were, you know, when we were thinking about the topography projects, uh, we were considering PDMS, but at the same time, this project is about industrial applications. So I don't know, Natalie, do you want to <laughs> comment? I think we were, so FEP is uh, often compared to Teflon. It's a non-stick surface. So initially we were naive and the initial outlook actually was that no proteins would absorb to FEP and no cells would ever adhere to FEP because it's so inert, it's so hydrophobic, super hydrophobic in fact. And um, we were surprised to find that actually yes, proteins do absorb very quickly and basically in the same manner as they do to polystyrene and many other surfaces. Um, so the hydrophobicity itself actually doesn't prevent that. Um, and cells do adhere to FEP given the right circumstances. Uh, and so that was a big learning moment for us. And I think it illustrates that protein absorption is a universal phenomenon that appears on basically any material that you're using rapidly. Um, this has an impact on cell culture, uh, any biofarm application, food and beverage, anything. Um, so any protein will absorb very quickly. And I think with PDMS, it's going to fall into the same category. You just have to understand how much protein will absorb. Um, is there sort of, you know, you cover it with surface, with the uh, with uh, the surface with proteins. Is there a certain limit that is reached? Okay, all of the surface is, is covered and it's bound and now you're good to go. Uh, or, you know, does it get washed away? Is there some competitive adhesion once you enter a new type of protein? And so those are all questions that we ask ourselves in terms of cell culture, that is a long-term culture. Um, is there's an absorption phase? Is there a desorption phase? Is there a single layer, multi-layer of proteins? It's a fun world, it's very complex. And I think um, we're just at the beginning of truly understanding of how in vitro culture systems work. And, you know, you can try to add super hydrophilic moieties to prevent desorption to some extent, or you can do the opposite. You can try to pre-absorb certain proteins that are not very cell adhesive or, or other things that will block, you know, that won't interact with cell receptors. But ultimately, it's very difficult long-term to prevent any type of adhesion mechanism. Very interesting. Okay. I mean, actually, it's we more. need to do lots of fundamental studies on this. And you started off this. So that's great more complicated yeah. than we thought yeah. it is it's surprising and i think uh, yeah. <laughs> what's interesting to this is that it's so universally applicable we all do cell yeah. culture we all use polystyrene and we generally don't give much thought to that aspect of it but it affects all of us in uh, whether it's just a fundamental r d any type of cell culture that you do in the lab any essay that you use a lot of them will have proteins in them uh, those proteins might get stuck to your pipette tips they might end up in the dish they, you might lose them on the way of, of doing your your testing in any capillary or any tubing um, so once you start thinking about it, i think you start seeing how complex it truly is and how fundamental and how useful the the information actually is that you're collecting so it's very exciting. Yeah, yeah and the yeah. choice of the choice of polystyrene. Going back to your question, Mosin, about like why do we use these polymers? I think maybe in fifty years, a hundred years, humanity might reconsider some of these choices. <laughs> yeah, I was mostly thinking about reducing the you know the amount of plastic production, and you know in terms of, but that's another topic. Maybe some some other materials that are biodegradable eventually. But it's something else. Sustainability yeah. is one of our main focus points, actually, in Single Bain, because we are a materials company and we do have an, uh, uh, yeah, a consciousness around sustainability and trying to become mm -hmm. more sustainable with the product of products that we offer and um, really focusing on the the. Um, cradle to grave uh, process and everything. Um, polymers can, is, is one of those areas. Again, because they're patient specific and uh, single use components for any clinical applications are still somewhat considered to be separate from the rest. Um, mm -hmm. the, the sort of plastic straws that you get from your, you know, Starbucks coffee in the morning that end up in the, in the ocean is, is 
one type of waste that we want to avoid yeah. producing. But I think in terms of cell therapy, we're still utilizing the benefits and profiting from the benefits of having those single use materials that are clean, that are providing a good barrier and have no leachables extractables and will be safe and reliable for the administration of those products, at least for now, uh, until we figure out a better material and a better composition that is as safe, as reliable, as easy to produce, but hopefully be sustainable in its composition and, and its use going forward. Yes, because if cell therapies yeah, do expand, then we'll use a lot of them. Yeah, and if you yeah. ask me, like this leachable is problematic if you're using biodegradable substrates, it's going to be uh, an, an issue. Maybe the, the way to go is to recycle monomers. This is something <laughs> I've been yeah. wanting to do ever since I started on McGill. If any but he's interested in, in the collaboration on that. It's something that's been uh, bothering me for a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Things like, you know, maybe maybe materials that can be degraded by certain type of bacteria. Not Perhaps, but that. perhaps it can also be like, you know, monomer recycling with a, or, you know, yeah. kind of a depolymerization or, you know, solvent uh, dissolution process where you can recycle the solvent. This is what I'm thinking. But. Yeah, things like this, the more we reduce this plastic footprint is the better anyways. But but that's that's something that's a topic for the future. Right now we have health problems to solve. And then uh, 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 the, the, uh, I have a follow up question and uh, uh, we have a couple of questions from the audience as well. And I don't know how much time do you guys have? Uh, do you have until like 10.30 or uh, like 1.30 your time? I do. I don't know about Natalie. <laughs> I'm afraid, yes. Okay. So we have a couple of questions. So I'll give, uh, let me just start with uh, like, you know, the questions from the audience first. And I can always ask my questions offline. Uh, so is uh, the attachment, AJ is asking this question. Is the attachment of proteins to FEP mediated by lipids bound to... Uh, uh, PSA, bovine serum albumin? I don't think so. I I don't know. Not, not as far as I know. I We haven't looked at BSA with and without lipids. Um, but in my view, it's more like the hydrophobic portions of amino acids are probably interacting with the FEP. Uh, Natalie, what's your... <laughs> yeah, we haven't really studied that uh, with a closer look. Uh, in detail, but I agree with Corinne that the albumin itself and the hydrophobic, <coughs> hydrophobic interactions are probably driving protein absorption overall. Lipids are interesting because they're essential for cell culture, um, but we don't re really understand their role in facilitating any type of cell adhesion to surfaces or being generally beneficial for cell expansion or cell health in, in the dish. Um, we know that they need it, uh, we're adding them on purpose, uh, but we, I don't think there's generally understood why or how exactly those things act. The, the other thing to consider, you know, you talk about hydrophobic interactions, but you have to consider the hydrophobic effect. Basically, the proteins hiding this very hydrophobic material from the water, like freeing up the water so that it can move around more, have higher free energy. So uh, this is a, you know, Gibbs free energy problem as well, not just a interaction problem. Wonderful. So Argus uh, son has a, a question, which I always say uh, also have that, that was my question too. What about RGD or uh, polylysine or matrigel coating uh, on tissue cultures? So uh, can you uh, comment on, on these kinds of, you know, coating or applications? <laughs> Nothing. Okay, you want to wanna... take that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll talk about the so for cell therapy applications and the clinical application, um, I think the attention of the regulatory uh, agencies is to have the system be as defined as possible, as clean and as risk-free as possible. So a lot of cell types do require certain coatings for adhering and for culturing efficiently. We're aware of that. Uh, I think there's... Um, a question mark as to the source of the material that you're using. Is it an animal derived product? Is it recombinantly manufactured? Uh, and how complex or easy is the composition? Matrogel is famous for you know, working really efficiently, but it's also like a very complex mixture of various things that is hard to control in the clinical and regulatory context. 
So when you're keeping a quality eye on the production process, again, simplicity is key. Being able to trace uh, amounts, even tiny amounts of any residual coating elements in your final product um, can be a problem on the way to the clinic. So um, in terms of coatings, yes, uh, I think a pre-coated sort of safe, robust um, off the shelf product is one of the things that we're definitely looking at um, because it would make everyone's lives a lot easier in terms of ease of use. It needs to, of course, still perform. But um, having pre-coded surfaces can be tricky in terms of making sure it's universally working for all cell types and that it is um, compliant with the FDA and other agencies and their expectations of use. So it's, it's a tricky, it's a tricky subject. And you know, later gel. There, let's say even with proponent stem cells, you can replace that with recombinant retinactin, for example. And that's the way uh, people that are going to the clinic are are going uh, largely. Um, I want to pitch <laughs> a paper by my uh, PhD student. Uh, who, well, my my former PhD student, Mohammed El Khadiri. He worked on. Uh, conjugating RGD onto aminated polystyrene. And he was able to show that compared to matrix gel, he was actually getting better outcomes in terms of endothelial colony forming cell expansion, both the initial colonies and then the subsequent expansion uh, compared to matrix gel, uh, compared to collagen. So um, in certain cases, it can be even better. We think that it's because the density of the RGD, like the surface density per centimeter square was higher than in the collagen uh, coated surfaces. So there can even be sometimes an advantage to having a defined surface, but you're gonna drive up the cost. But at the same time, you have to consider if you lose an entire batch because you have a bad lot of, of collagen or matrix gel, that's, that's also a cost. Yeah, maybe to expand on that. So proteins are generally not easy to work with and like they work as a coating, uh, but in terms of a commercial manufacturing process, I think a chemical treatment is a lot easier to make and to maintain uh, also in terms of sh shelf life and, and storage conditions compared to any protein coating. Um, proteins typically require specific storage conditions. They have a half-life, they degrade pretty quickly. Um, they're a lot more, prone to degradation and sort of errors in the process compared to a chemical treatment or plasma polymer um, coating in general. So also something to keep in mind. Cool. So uh, let me ask you uh, a question about uh, view life bags. So they're flexible bags. So when I look at them, we are dealing with uh, these flexible bags and then we compare them to this rigid uh, plast like uh, tissue plast, right? Polystyrene mm -hmm. tissue plast. Mm -hmm. And then I'm, I'm thinking about the cells, the adherent cells that you grow on these uh, surfaces. So uh, I take this tissue flax from like the, uh, like the plastic one from, from an incubator, I move it, I image it and then put it back in the, uh, in the, in the incubator. So when I take these bags, then the surface starts deforming. Because yes. They're flexible, right? Correct. So can you can you comment on the effect of these mechanical forces on the uh, you know on the cells, especially stem cells or other cells that are like you know uh, they are very sensitive to some mechanical forces. Yep, it's a good point. I think uh, there's a definitely a change in the handling uh, of the cultures when you go from a rigid container like your flasks to the bags. Um, once you start working with the bags, yes, they are flexible and material, um, which means that as you are handling them, you will invert, uh, sort of, of course, you will have some mechanical input on the cells. Uh, in terms of adherent cells, if the MSCs and more, say, strongly adherent robust cells, they generally don't care. Um, loosely adherent cells like monocytes, dendritic cells may detach um, if you sort of, uh, so depending on how you handle the bag. Again, also there's differences between smaller and larger bags. So with larger bags, you have more surface area. Generally, you don't disturb the cells as much compared to maybe a smaller bag. It depends on, on sort of your handling and uh, care, carefulness in, in using them. Generally, we have not observed any sort of quick detachment of the cells just because you're handling the bag. Mm -hmm. They actually do stay intact or stay adhe adherent to the surface because they do bind to the proteins or the surface um, 
itself. And once they, so protein absorption is step number one. And then once the cells start to adhere, they actually start producing their own cell extracellular matrix and their own proteins that they really use to anchor themselves down. It may not be visible, but it's actually a quite strong type of adhesion that even with mechanically disturbing the, the cultures in the bags, uh, doesn't lead to cell detachment very easily, um, which mm -hmm. is reassuring to see, I think. Um, but it's definitely a different handling experience. I see. So I imagine, I know I work with these bags. Do you have, like, you know, transport them, you know, transfer them vertically or you just hold them horizontally? How, how, how does that work? Um, so typically we culture them in static culture uh, horizontally on the shelf. Um, okay. We have, we do recommend using a culture rack too for optimal uh, gas okay. exchange if your cells are particularly sensitive to oxygen and transfer rates or CO2. Uh, but basically um, it's a bag, uh, very similar to the blood bag that you probably yeah. are used to seeing. Yeah. A different material, of course, uh, but the same way that we just place the bag horizontally on the rack and um, the cells uh, are cultured in there. The cells will settle based on gravity on the bottom of the material. Yeah. Um, and they can, depending on if it's a suspension cells or adherent cell, of course, be disturbed by uh, sort of shaking the bag if you want to. Yeah, um, the material itself is gas permeable. So the cells that sit on the bottom, of course, will get their gas exchange mainly from the, the bottom yeah. and the top, of course. Okay. That makes sense. If you want some samples, I'm happy to send you some. <laughs> I, I, I would love to receive some samples and then uh, maybe later on uh, we, can, we can discuss some potential collaborations as well because uh, there are some ideas over there. Uh, so, uh, so Human, do you have a question? Yeah, I do have a question because I remember that Corinne showed QCMD, QCMD results and we have a cocktail of polymers, albumin, fibrinogen and others. I'm just wondering in that QCMAD, I saw that which one is uh, absorbing first, fibrinogen? Okay. So, so it wasn't fibrinogen, it was albumin, swan, and transferrin. And that was because those are the main proteins that were in the serum free medium that we were using at the time. And they absorb on a relatively similar time scale, but the problem is the graphs that i showed they were all done if i remember correctly one milligram per milliliter <laughs> um but then in the in the meat or one microgram per milliliter i'm not I'm, i might be off by a thousand full <laughs> but in any case that was to be able to compare them at the same concentration but then we also considered in the medium where albumin is overabundant like it overwhelms the other protein so it's albumin that's going to absorb first because uh, you know, when you have uh, equilibrium with the, co you know, concentration solution determines uh, part of the rate of absorption. So it's, um, when you look at, let's say, a Langmuir isotherm, you have to consider concentration. So it's, it's albumin that's going to absorb first in that sense. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. But that's for the medium we were using, which had a lot of albumin in it. Most, most, cell, uh, most, uh, CM free media will have a lot of albumin, but not all of them. Some of them come without albumin. Like for example, um, the uh, E8 medium for stem cell, plurpon stem cell culture doesn't have albumin. So that's going to change the conclusion. Most awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Corinne and uh, Natalie. Yeah. Awesome, please go ahead. We have questions coming from and one more question. 130, time. 130 uh, our time, but we have two other questions. <laughs> Well, but I perhaps encourage you can take two to, more. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps I you can take one or two more questions, questions, and then what we can do is, if you have more questions, you can email us. Exactly. Um, I was, I was yeah, encouraging you. Yeah. To, yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. awesome. uh, so uh, let me. Okay, uh, so so I'll ask the first question from A A J. Uh, the other question: If proteins attached to F E P. Uh, or polystyrene via hydrophobic amino acid, this would suggest that the first layer of proteins are likely partially or fully denatured. Can you please comment on this possibility? Yeah, I have to think back again what the QCMD data was telling us in terms of the packing density. Um, this is what intuitively you would think, but again, it, it depends on um, 
the hydrophobic interactions and how tightly they pack. So for sure, there's going to be a little bit of conformation change, but I don't like if they don't unfold in the sense that they spread on the surface and take up a lot more than their surface area, as I recall. But you have to go back to the paper that I referenced. So this is uh, Andres Varganau. I can post the link in the in the in the reference based on the mass that we detected in that first layer. We were able to do some calculations to figure out the protein density. And from that, we could figure out, you know, based on the radius of each protein, how they were packing. And so I don't think they were, they were definitely not like completely unfolding on the surface and taking up a huge surface area. I think the packing was pretty high, but this, yeah, I'm going to refer you back to the paper because I don't recall exactly. To follow up on that is, um, yeah, I think it's intuitive to think that probably some proteins will have a denatured conformation, and we thought that as well. However, we also did some antibody binding studies, and those only bind to the conformation, like the intact conformation, and they were able to bind to the albumin on the surface. So those studies showed us that actually we believe that the albumin is in its original conformation, at least that the active binding sites are available to be um, bound to by the, the antibody. So I don't think we have a definitive answer on what the surface uh, that protein ad layer looks like, but from what we've seen, it seems to be in its uh, original conformation state. Uh, the, the, other, the other thing to remember is if you have that double layer forming, the one the proteins on top, those are definitely going to be in their, uh, um, their they're a lot more likely to be in their native conformation. Um, but even that first layer, I believe they were not, you have to consider it's not necessarily hydrophobic and amino acids interacting with the surface. It can be just the hydrophobic effect that I mentioned earlier with the second law of thermodynamics uh, dictating you know, the, the, the adsorption phenomena part, part of it. And then the proteins can rearrange on the surface, but um, anyways, yeah. Uh, so it's very, uh, it's very complex. It is. Yeah, it's it's more yeah. complex than you'd think. Like uh, intuitively, you'd think like, oh, the hydrophobic core unfolds, and then it. But that's not necessarily what's happening. Also, why we have been ongoing for seven years now in this collaboration. <laughs> so, and it's continuing. You know, and it's continuing. <laughs> Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll ask the last uh, the last question from uh, from the audience, and I uh, ask my my question maybe later via email. Uh, so uh, so it's a it's a follow up on my question about the flexibility of the substrate and uh, whether uh, uh, the this flexibility sh sh affect the you know uh, the the behavior or the function of the cells or the phenotype of the cells. If they are, uh, you know, exposed to these kinds of mechanical forces, or even even if you have studied those, or not. Um, so a good point. Yes, obviously the cells are mechanically responsive. I think MSCs are famous for being um, very responsive to their microenvironment. Uh, whether they are on a bone, very stiff like substrate, they will differentiate towards becoming bone. If they're on a cartilage, softer uh, substrate, they will differentiate towards that. Um, so the cells are instructed by the stiffness and the type of material, all of the factors that we discussed, topography, surface roughness included. We have not done any comprehensive study on what FEP would induce the cells to do, um, mainly because our main focus is on expanding MSCs, uh, multipotent MSCs, and we've actually switched from the adherent cell culture on our bags to a microcarrier-based cell culture system in which the MSCs would be cultured on polystyrene microcarriers, um, again, the same ones we mentioned, um, and for expansion purposes, less for differentiation purposes. Um, I am, and we are very curious to see what the FEP itself would do to induce in terms of MSC differentiation, um, because I think it would be attractive to be able to produce uh, some pre-differentiated cells that are already in the chondrogenic lineage for a clinical regenerative medicine type application. But we haven't done it yet. It's one of the um, projects on my wish list to do in my lab, uh, hopefully um, by the end of this year. And also, in terms of the monocytes, uh, remember how Natalie mentioned that some of them were deering? We were surprised to see that. 
um, when we looked at their surface marker expression, at least we didn't see major differences between the ones that were adhered and the ones that were in suspension. So I think it all depends on context, on salt type. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, folks. I mean, uh, we were a little bit over time, and then still, again, uh, there are questions. Uh, it's a, a very interesting topic, and then uh, and thank you very much, both of you, for your inspiring talks. Uh, I personally really enjoyed it, and then uh, we'll definitely chat in future in conferences and other places, and I'll ask about you know the progress of these collaboration and. Uh, the, uh, so with that, uh, if Human doesn't have uh, uh, more questions, no, I just I'm, wanted uh, to thank uh, Natalie and uh, Corinne. Uh, I really enjoyed it, and it was a great discussion. And we got lots of questions from audience, and I think we had lots of questions from you that you can ask uh, both uh, later on. Just uh, encourage everybody to just follow us for uh, upcoming uh, seminars. We continue this through summer, and hopefully after pandemic and uh, and then hope to see everybody today we, today also we had a great turnout a turnaround and uh, hopefully we'll see everybody here again next week next uh, next uh, week uh, like noon uh, eastern time thank you so much thank you again have a great Take day care. thank you bye 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 thank you bye bye, -bye.